Video gaming, at least how we know it now, isn't that old. In fact, the first video game consoles manifested in the mid-70s. The entire gaming industry is only roughly 50 years old. That's pretty modern if you ask me. But 50 years is still a long time. It's a long time to evolve, to discover new things, to create a new edge in a very lucrative and rewarding market. And because of that, there's been quite a few high visibility lawsuits throughout the years that have put our favorite companies in the limelight. I don't recall exactly what episode I brought it up in, but I did mention that I would be open to the idea of covering 10 important video game lawsuits throughout our hobby's history. And that's exactly what this video will be all about. Let's begin. In order to talk about the landscape of video game lawsuits, we need to understand what I consider to be one of the most important lawsuits ever to happen in the video gaming industry, Magnavox vs. Atari. The Magnavox Odyssey was a pioneer of the industry. It was a simple machine that kickstarted the video game craze, courtesy of Ralph Baer in 1975. Now, fundamentally, the console isn't anything compared to what we would see only a few years later, but it was a milestone in technology at the time, a simple machine that generated dots, three to be exact. And the way that it worked is that you would put in a circuit card, pop on some Mylar overlays onto your TV, and use your imagination to play very rudimentary games. I actually own one, it's a pride of my collection because it works, sometimes. But someone else in history found the Odyssey to be important as well, Nolan Bushnell. Now to rehash the history of Nolan Bushnell would be really redundant because I've already done it twice on the channel. But the video that you will want to watch if this is important to you is the first generation's episode. I think a lot of you would like it. It's nothing but straight information about our wonderful pastime, the entire origin story of the video gaming industry. But let's still do a quick little recap. Nolan Bushnell got together with Ted Dabney and created Syzygy, an astronomical term that describes when the planets align, which is likely what it felt like creating one of the first true arcade games, Computer Space, an arcade adaptation of Space War for the PDP-1 minicomputer. Then another inspiration came, the Magnavox Odyssey and its unique little ping pong game. Bushnell got with Al Alcorn and created a game of ping pong that you all should know, Pong. They also changed their name to a different one, Atari, a term from Go, a Japanese game of skill. Back then, video games or even the idea of video games was so novel that people wanted to do it better, which is exactly what Bushnell did, but so did every single company imaginable. There are at least 890 plus Pong clones out there in the first generation of gaming alone, and Magnavox sat back and waited until one fateful day to clamp down on people that used their idea, and it sent waves through the industry. It fractured Atari, at least how we knew it. It decimated Allied Leisure, and it removed Chicago Coin from the map. This series of crackdowns went from 1977 to 1988. Even Activision was in the crosshairs, and Magnavox won every single lawsuit for every other company that infringed on their ball and paddle formula. And the damages that they sought totaled about $100 million. They essentially sued everyone. And then one day, they didn't renew the patent in the 1990s. But by then, Magnavox wasn't nearly the pioneers of the industry in comparison to other companies. Unfortunately, though, <laughs> it won't be the last time that Atari would be in the crosshairs. Sega was one of the companies that dominated the arcade market in the 80s, alongside Taito, Data East, Atari, and Namco. However, the arcade golden age, it didn't last very long. Sega themselves created the Sega Master System line, or SG-1000 line, in response to Nintendo's Famicom. The whole concept of home market development was very lucrative, and many companies transitioned to focusing on video game consoles in conjunction with their arcade endeavors. Nintendo and Sega, they were both concerned about people reverse engineering their software. They really didn't like unlicensed software or even unlicensed publishers. The NES had a hardware solution, the 10 NES chip, which was like a checksum chip. It acted as a lock. And the ROM, provided that it was a licensed game, held the key. If the key wasn't there, the system would power cycle, causing a blinking light on your NES. The Genesis, however, took a software approach. Have you ever popped in a Genesis game and saw this brief little message? Produced by or under license from Sega Enterprises. Sometimes it shows up, but you can usually generate it by putting in a game and pressing the reset button a few times. That's the TMSS, 
or the trademark security system. And how it worked was that somewhere in the game's code, there was a sequence of characters or a string, if you're a programmer, that said the word Sega. If it was there, it would allow the game to play. Make sense? Now let's go all the way back to 1988. A company by the name of Accolade decided that they didn't want to pay all of the fees that Sega wanted in terms of licensing. It was almost 10 to $15 every single cartridge that was created. So they reverse engineered Genesis software code to be able to move their PC games to the Genesis, such as Ishido, The Way of Stones, Turrican, and Star Control. This led to a lawsuit between Accolade and Sega in 1991. Sega's stance was that Accolade infringed on their copyrights and accused Accolade of deceptive business practices, while Accolade's stance involved claiming fair use, of which the court refused to accept. The court judged in favor of Sega, and Accolade had to recall all of their Genesis-compatible games. But Accolade wouldn't go down swinging. They appealed, and they won. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed the decision of the district court that managed the case after deep diving into copyright law and fair use. Now, after this appeal, Sega was preparing a counter argument, but then out of nowhere, Accolade and Sega settled, which is weird. After that settlement, they became a licensee of Sega, so why the fuck even bother with all the extra hurdles? Probably because they lost $15 million while they were under a period of injunction. They couldn't make any games. Have you ever played a game that has the likeness of someone? Think of professional sports players, real life fighters, or maybe even real life characters from live action films? That's where Heart vs. Electronic Arts comes into play. For a long time, EA was pushing out NCAA titles, and then one day, they stopped, right? Ever wondered why? Well, it's because Ryan Hart, one of the quarterbacks for Rutgers University, noticed that number 13 in NCAA football 2006 for Rutgers University looked awfully a lot like him. He also had the same height, the same weight, and in his player details, he happened to be from the same hometown. So, Hart took the litigation. Now, this brought into question a few things. The NCAA historically did not allow players to seek compensation for their abilities or their likenesses. That included commercials or advertisements, and if they did, they would lose their NCAA amateur status. So for years, EA ran the NCAA line by taking stats from players and pumping it out. Ryan could not receive money for his likeness being used per NCAA's rules. EA was also at fault for taking thousands of athletes' likenesses for their games. So what exactly came from this? Well, NCAA football as a franchise ceased to exist in 2014. The NCAA, they took a look inwards. And finally, after so many years of a chokehold on college athletes, decided to revise their rules to allow for players to seek compensation for their likeness in 2024. So what does that mean for EA? We can finally have our college football games back. In fact, EA College Sports Football 25 is just around the corner, and it feels damn good to have them back. This one's pretty stupid. You know Donkey Kong? Well, Universal Studios felt that Donkey Kong was a little bit too much like King Kong. Yeah, okay, bro. Fundamentally, it's a game that has an oversized horny gorilla kidnapping a pretty lady, and a short guy climbs rivets and structures to rescue pretty lady, right? It's a very generic, and may I say, fucking stupid, lawsuit. Universal ended up losing, too, because they made the bright idea of suing other people and claiming that King Kong was in public domain. So guess what, giga -chode goblins? Free reign to utilize a concept. But Donkey Kong itself? Interesting legal history. Let's cover that, too. So Donkey Kong was massive, right? And while the Universal lawsuit was kind of a big deal and high visibility, if not for a little while, it's not very often that we discuss the bullshit that happened behind the scenes for Nintendo. You see, Donkey Kong wasn't solely made by Nintendo as much as we would all love to believe. They subcontracted to a tech company, Ikigami Sushiniki, to help clean up some of the code for the arcade cabinet. But Donkey Kong was an unexpected success, right? It grossed $1.4 billion in the arcades alone, with over three distinct revisions, and Ikigami wanted some of that sweet, tasty capital. Ikigami actually claimed ownership of the game. Nintendo said, you're fucking dumb, go away. But they kept suing each other. Eventually, they settled. Now, where Nintendo goofed up was that in Donkey Kong Jr., they 100%, and I do mean 100%, reverse engineered the technological additions that Ikigami created, and they released the game to the wild. So what do we do? Sue so And they did, and they won. True story.
Nintendo was a smart company. They were also very cautious. The video game crash of 1983 fractured the video game industry as we know it. And if you want to learn more about it, I also have a Generations episode about that as well. It's a great source of information. I really do think that y'all will enjoy this. But in that episode, I talk about how Nintendo was very strict. They would limit companies to five games a year. That's common knowledge. But what isn't is how invasive they were towards developers. Nintendo wanted control of cartridge production from point A to point B. They also wanted an exclusivity clause as well. A game belonged to the NES for two years. Many companies thought, how can we go between the lines? How can we have an edge by technicality? They would create shadow companies. Have you ever played a game from Ultra Games or even Palcom? Both of those are actually Konami. Tengen was the same thing. It was actually, well, you could probably guess, <laughs> Atari. As a shadow company, Tengen didn't want to deal with the red tape and requirements, so they did what they felt was necessary. They created the rabbit chip to bypass the 10 NES copyright protection, and they were sued because of it. It was a long battle, about six years from 1988 to 1994, and if that wasn't enough, they released their own Tetris, which got them sued again. And because of that, they couldn't sell Tetris. And that's why Tengen's Tetris is so rare. Only about 50,000 of them were allowed to be sold. This is a simple one. Namco created Pac-Man, but when it came time to distribute Pac-Man in America, they wanted Atari to do it. And they knew what they wanted to do. They wanted to put it on their 2600. And we all know how that ended up. Great job, Atari. But Philips, they created a game that was very similar. It was known as Casey Munchkin, and they put it on their console, the Magnavox Odyssey 2. Atari was not pleased with this, and they sued them. It's so funny to see those tables turned. Magnavox first sued Atari, and now Atari was suing Magnavox. It was a precedent for copyright law and computer programs. True story. Atari did win that case, and in response, Magnavox straight up dropped a second generation diss track in Casey Munchkin's sequel, Casey's Crazy Chase where the main enemy looks tremendously like the centipede from Atari. Even called it the Dratapillar. <laughs> That's petty. The next two lawsuits are going to involve similarities between games. Some of you might remember Crazy Taxi. Sega released it in 1999, and from the top of my head, it was in the arcades and it was on the Dreamcast. Now, the interesting thing about Crazy Taxi is that Sega actually filed a patent for it that exists to this day. Patent 6,200,138. But if I refer to it again, I'm just going to call it the 138 patent because that's what it is. Now, the 138 patent includes specific verbiage. It states a game display method, moving direction indicating method, a game apparatus, and a drive simulating apparatus. And they were awarded that patent. Like I said, it still exists to this day. Now, clones aren't a new thing, right? GTA has been rehashed by a few companies. Saints Row in particular made fun of it for years. Rockstar never lost their mind. Neither did Take Two. But Sega went off the fucking rails whenever Radical Entertainment developed The Simpsons Road Rage in 2001. They took not only Radical Entertainment to court, but also the two publishers, Fox Interactive and Electronic Arts, in a patent infringement claim, and they won. But the result, it was just a private settlement, so we'll never really know the damage that was done. Capcom was a lot like Sega. They both found themselves in the limelight for damn good arcade games. Sega, Namco, Taito, Williams, Capcom, Data East, and Atari were the powerhouse companies that dominated the arcade spectrum for years, and Capcom hit their sweet spot with Street Fighter II. That game perfected the tournament fighter genre, period dot. But like I said in the beginning of this episode, people love to say, I can do better. And Data East in this case was the company that said it, and they created Fighter's history. Now the key issue here is that the game does look and sound like Street Fighter, and the characters, they are reminiscent of Street Fighter characters, either by design, story implements, or the characters' movesets. For example, Rei plays like Ken, Makoto plays like Ryu, and Jean-Pierre is romantic, much like Vega. In terms of story, Liu Felin is reminiscent of Chun-Li, but her objective is to topple the big bad guy, Karnov. Yeah. That Karnov, like Karnov's Revenge Karnov. Now you know. And finally, the movesets. Matlock throws a flaming CD that looks a lot like Guile's projectile, the sonic boom. Ray shoots a fireball from his hands, like a Hadouken. And all of these consistencies that I just mentioned made Capcom think that they had a leg to stand on. But a court decided that Fighter's history maintained Saint Affaire. It's French for scene to be made. 
Let's see, how can I put this into perspective? It's like if I produced a horror film in the 80s. The standard was slasher elements. I'd need gore, I'd need a lovable character, a setting that allows for people to be exploited, I'd need a scary, imposing character that may or may not speak. Nobody would be pissed if I put titties in it. It's the 80s, and now that I think about it, I think I'd add in some scary sound effects, some loud jump scares. All of these tropes are considered sin à faire, the scene to be made. That's the stance that the courts took and Capcom lost their lawsuit. Our final lawsuit today is perhaps the second most important lawsuit in video gaming history, so it's fitting to end this episode. Back in the early years of game development, games were created by the company for the company. There were no third party developers. If you made a game, it belonged to the company. Period. Dot. Now the first generation, this wasn't really an issue. It was a massive Pong orgy and no, you weren't invited. This happened so many times. 850, 890, there's really no confirmed number. It was just a huge saturation of knockoff shitty Pong clones that had like four games top and all of which were variances of Pong. It was the wild, wild west, the uncharted territory of video gaming. And then out of nowhere, the second generation was created by Fairchild with their Channel F. We finally had a variety of games and that interested Atari, right? Atari was a great company to work for. You could light up a joint and then port an Atari arcade game to the 2600 and that was that. That's what Atari did. And they did it well, until Warner Brothers took over. After Ray Kassar became the new CEO, he wanted time cards. He wanted the employees to dress nice. It was a pretty drastic change. And one of the policy changes that he implemented was that none of the programmers would be identified, a decision that many Japanese development companies had already taken to prevent poaching of programmers. If you need an example, play any game on the NES or Super Nintendo and look at the credits. Sometimes you'll see nicknames like Keiji Inafune, who went by Anaf King, or Nin Nin, who was actually Akira Nishitani. Now the 2600 in its earlier years raked in tons of revenue. They were proud of it. So proud that they decided to circulate a memo every single quarter saying how much they made and who developed the games that were successful. And that was their mistake. Among the highest echelon of programmers were David Crane, Larry Kaplan, Alan Miller, and Bob Whitehead. They single-handedly accounted for 60% of Atari's sales, and they weren't happy. In fact, they straight up put their hands in a Go Team formation and said, eh, fuck you, and they left. They created their own company, which was known as Computer Arts Incorporated. Ugh, that doesn't sound good. What about VSync? Nah, nobody will be able to pronounce that. What about active television? Eh, that sucks too. But I tell you what, let's combine it. Active television, Activision for short. The existence of Activision sent Ray Kassar into a pissed off spiral of rich man buffoonery because those four knew everything that went into programming a 2600 game. And he claimed that they had insider knowledge and they sued Activision in 1982 but it resulted in a settlement. But that settlement is what's so important. That settlement alone validated the third party business model. And from that day forward, the third party developer came to existence. You can thank Activision for that. I know this episode was a little bit longer than was to be expected, but I think it was a good topic to discuss. Are there any other topics that you would like covered by me? I'm always open to unique aspects of gaming history. So if there's something that you've always been curious about, let me do the heavy work. I love making videos for you all and interacting with you every single day. If you made it to the end of this video, you're definitely at home, so feel free to hit that subscribe button as we work towards our next milestone of 8,000 subscribers. Finally, the most important thing that you can do for me is to hit that thumbs up button as it directly impacts the visibility of the videos and the projects that I work on every single day. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, fortify your out.